Hey, welcome to the IR video series. My name's Kapil Wattamore. I'm a fourth year medical student at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, and I'm on the SIR Medical Student Council. I have the pleasure of reviewing basic IR tools and the challenge of doing so in a brief presentation. So let's jump right into it. So I'll be focusing on three basic tools, needles, wires, and catheters, really three staples in any IR procedure. And I'm going to move through this kind of quickly, but before we get to all that, I wanted to touch on the topic of obtaining access because it nicely involves all three of these tools and it shows how they're used in conjunction with one another. The first thing that you have to do in any IR procedure, whether it's vascular or non-vascular, is get into the body. And so in vascular procedures, that means getting into an artery or a vein. And the micropuncture kit is essential to doing that. It comes with an introducer needle, guide wire, a dilator, and sheath. And we're going to go over some of the specifications for these later on. But in essence, what you're doing is switching these tools out for each other. And once you're in, you're using wires and catheters to navigate your way to the area of interest. The technique to do this was developed by Dr. Seldinger, a Swedish radiologist, in the 1950s. And the first step is inserting a needle where you suspect the vessel is or where you see it on the ultrasound. When you see blood returning from the back, you know you're in the lumen. And tactile feedback is very important when you're doing this, so you know you're not dissecting through the wall or puncturing the back wall. Next, you insert a guide wire through the needle into the vessel, and you remove your needle. So now you have the wire maintaining your access into the vessel. Then you use a blade to make a skin nick at the insertion site, and you pass a dilator right over the wire to open up that tract so that you can then insert larger caliber instruments later on, like catheters. You don't want to lose control of the wire as you're doing this. And once the dilator is in, you can take out the inner dilator part of it, leaving the outer sheath in the vessel, and that's your access. And that access is going to let you pass a wire or a wire catheter system into the vessel in order to then navigate to the area of interest. All right, let's talk about needles. A pretty broad strokes classification of needles is that they can be used for either access or biopsy. Access needles are used to get into vessels like we just saw or organs or collections. And it's a good thing to know that different size needles will accept different size guide wires. So two common size pairings to know are 19 gauge needle accepts a 035 guide wire, meaning 0.035 inches in diameter, and a 21 gauge needle accepts an 018 guide wire. You may have astutely observed that the larger the gauge, the smaller the needle. And conveniently, needles often have color-coded back ends, and you'll probably recognize the calibers that your department uses based on the color. But unfortunately, the measurement system in IR can be pretty confusing because there's a different unit used for every tool. While for needles, the outer diameter is measured in gauge, the thickness of a wire is measured in inches, the outer diameter of a catheter is measured in French, and balloons and stents are measured in millimeters. So it's good to have a rule of thumb handy I like to remember that 19 gauge is about 0.038 inches, or about 3 French, which is 1 millimeter. So remember, you divide French by 3 to get millimeters. And keeping all that in mind will help you decide which tools can be used together. Biopsy needles, on the other hand, are designed to remove tissue for pathology or microbioanalysis. And there's two types. There's fine needle aspiration, or FNA, and core biopsy. And FNA needles tend to be smaller in caliber. Uh, they're produced with different tip configurations to facilitate the removal of cells, often with suction. Some of the more popular designs are a Chiba, which is a wedge tip, or the Westcott, which has a side cutting notch, or Francine, which is serrated. And these needles are typically inserted through a larger guiding needle. But you have to be very careful when you're going in with them, especially if you're in the abdomen. You need to be careful not to accidentally transgress bowel. That would be very bad. Core biopsy needles are larger in caliber. They're designed to cut out cores or cylinders of tissue and retain them in the device. These devices, they're usually spring-loaded, so you don't have to hold suction when you're using them. And they're frequently placed through an outer guiding needle as well. Let's now shift our focus to wires. They seem pretty simple at first glance, but there's actually an incredible amount of engineering and reiteration that's gone into their evolution. 
But it's important to note that wires are often braided. That means that there is a core made out of some kind of metal and then an outer coil that runs down the wire. The access wires that we just talked about earlier, those are just cores, also called mandrels. They're not braided. You'll notice that interventional radiologists are very deliberate in choosing a wire to accomplish a certain task. Certain parameters that we'll talk about confer the specific attributes that you might be looking for in different parts of a procedure. If you have two wires that are both made of the same material, the one with the larger diameter is going to be stronger. That's because strength is proportional to radius to the fourth power. So the stronger wire is going to have better pushability. That means it can get through tough calcification or fibrosis. And the stronger wire is also going to have better device support. That means it's, it'll allow passing other devices over it, like balloons or catheters. And a smaller diameter wire has other, other advantages. It has better flexibility. That means it bends with direct pressure. And it's more trackable. That means that the body of the wire follows its tip around curves or bends in the vessel without kinking. So in general, larger diameter wires are stronger. Smaller diameter wires are easier to navigate. The material at the core of the wire is also important. One material is stainless steel. It's easy to torque. It's relatively rigid. So you can shape the tip the way you like it. And it'll stay like that. But unfortunately, it kinks. On the other hand, there's nitinol, which is nickel titanium. And that tends to be more flexible. It's kink resistant. But the trade-off is that it's less torqueable and it doesn't shape well. It tends to return to its original form after you shape it. Wires can taper off at their tips, and we care whether that happens gradually or abruptly. A nice, gradual, long taper is going to allow for better tracking along bends, but an abrupt, short taper would give you more support in short distances at the expense of probably prolapsing at bends instead of tracking smoothly. And the tips of wires can be very different from each other. If the core extends all the way to the tip, the tip tends to be more durable and gives you much better tactile feedback. But if the core doesn't extend all the way, the tip is more delicate, it's flexible, softer, it's easier to shape, and it's less likely to cause vessel injury. But the trade-off is that it's more likely to prolapse. Wires also have coatings on the outside, uh, either polymer or plastic sleeves that define how slippery they are. A hydrophobic coating like PTFE or Teflon will reduce friction and improve trackability, and it does that by repelling water and creating this smooth, wax-like surface. And hydrophobic coatings also give you more tactile feedback. So as you can imagine, if a wire is hydrophobic and it has a core that goes to the tip, it's going to have great tactile feedback relatively. A hydrophilic wire attracts water and feels like it has this slippery gel-like surface. Um, these wires have less tactile feedback, but they give you smoother tracking in tortuous vessels and less drag. Wires come in varying lengths, anywhere between 40 and 300 centimeters. A longer wire would allow you to deliver a device more distally without losing your wire position. So for example, an exchange length wire is a longer version of a wire that's long enough between the external end and the tip so that you can introduce a new catheter over it without losing purchase internally. There are two things that will make a wire less responsive to you torquing it. And one of them is wire length. As the distance between the tip and the torque device increases, the wire becomes less responsive. The other thing that does that is a tortuous path. More tortuosity means less torqueability. Finally, visibility is important. You need to know where the wire is as you're operating. And that's related to, first of all, the wire diameter. It makes sense to say that it's easier to see a larger caliber wire but it's also related to the density of the wire's material because that determines its radio opacity on the fluoro. And that's the gist of wires. As a student, you're likely going to be managing the table, so you should know how to handle wires. You should know that they need to be wiped with wet gauze when they're removed from the body because any clots or even dried contrast can cause it to stick inside the catheter or can actually even embolize. And when the wires are not being used, you should store them loosely coiled in a bowl of heparinized saline. We talked about a number of guide wire attributes, but why don't we talk about some real life examples to put it all together? So I just wanted to run through a few examples of commonly used wires. These first few are all 035 wires, starting with the Benson, which is low to medium stiffness. It's 
used to help insert catheters, introducer sheaths, and other devices in vascular work. It's also great for catheter exchanges. It has a straight tip that's very floppy since the core stops a good distance from the tip. It's atraumatic and it has a PTFE coating, so it's hydrophobic. Then there's the Rosen wire, which is medium stiffness. It's stiffer than the Benson and it has a J tip. That allows the wire to be stiff all the way to the end while still minimizing the risk of subintimal dissection because the tip curves away like that. And it's a great working wire in vascular intervention like angioplasty or stenting because of the atraumatic tip and the good stiffness. And it also comes in exchange length. Then there's the Amplatz, which is a very stiff wire, more so than the Benson and the Rosen. It has a floppy tip that can either be straight or curved. Great for exchanges. It's great for non-vascular intervention like drain placement. And it's used in vascular interventions too, since the stiffness can help straighten out tortuous anatomy. The Glide is a medium stiffness O35 wire that's very different from the first three because this one's hydrophilic. It's very slippery, so it can go anywhere, even places you don't want it to go. So it's not good for exchanges when your goal is to maintain your distal position. It comes with an angled or a straight tip, and you should be careful to avoid dissecting when you're using it. So those are very commonly used O35 wires. But I wanted to talk about a category of smaller wires known as microwires. These are particularly fine and used for selecting very small vessels. I'll just briefly touch on these and talk about one example, which is the Synchro. The Synchro is an 014 microwire. It's designed to fit in and lead a microcatheter. And it's extremely floppy. It has a directable tip. So if you can't get somewhere with this wire, you probably just can't get there. The last wire that I'll talk about is the COPE 018 mandrel. It's the one that comes with the micropuncture kit for access. It has a soft tip that makes it atraumatic. It's very commonly used. So that brings us now to catheters, which are inescapable in IR. Catheter is a pretty broad term, right? A Foley is a catheter that we're all familiar with. A chest tube is also a catheter, and so is a pick line. So the most basic underlying definition is that they're essentially tubes with a purpose. I like to divide that purpose into either vascular or non-vascular. Before we get into the design of vascular catheters, just wanted to share three quick things that you should know about handling them. First, always flush catheters before using them. That's to make sure that there's no leaks, that they're patent, and also to prevent thrombus formation. You don't want to introduce clots that are there back into the body. Second, always advance a catheter over a wire and lead with the wire. That's important to prevent intimal injury. And third, avoid folding a catheter since that might create kinks and those kinks become weak points where the catheter can burst. So imagine how dangerous that could be if it bursts while you're delivering chemotherapy or radioactive particles that were initially intended for a very specific target. Just like wires, catheters are designed and chosen to accomplish very specific goals. So if you look at the diagram here, you'll notice a few different curves that are pointed out. The first one is a primary curve. That's the bend at the very tip. And you would choose that based on the angle at which the target vessel takes off from its parent artery. The secondary curve is what gives some catheters that hook shape. And you would choose the degree of that curve based on the width of the parent vessel. And the tertiary curve is something you choose based on the natural curvature of the parent vessel. The tip length of a catheter is also important. The longer the tip, the more stability in the target vessel that you're hooking into. But that also makes it more difficult to maneuver the catheter in the parent vessel. Catheters are made of various materials. There is polyurethane, which tends to be relatively soft and pliable, so it follows wires easily when you're navigating to a target but it also has a high coefficient of friction. There's nylon, which has the advantage of being stiff and tolerating high flow rates. So that makes it great for aortography and arteriography in general. And Teflon is the stiffest material. It's very smooth. It has a low coefficient of friction. So it's used mainly for dilators and sheaths. Guide catheters are thin walled, large diameter catheters that allow you to pass other devices like balloons or stents or other catheters inside of them safely. We said earlier that catheters are sized by their outer diameters, and remember three French is one millimeter, so a typical guide catheter ranges from six to eight French. Moving on to diagnostic catheters now, 
Flush catheters are used for non-selective arteriography or venography, meaning that they're used for high-flow contrast injections into either the aorta or the IVC. The OmniFlush pictured here is an example. It has side holes that allow the contrast media to be dispersed uniformly, and it has a round end to prevent the vessel walls from getting whipped by the tip in power injections of contrast. Again, this is for the aorta or the IVC, but if you need to cannulate a particular vessel or opacify certain branches, you'll need something more selective. Selective catheters have particular shapes that are designed to seek the desired vessel ostium. The example that you see here is a Simmons Simmons catheter. It has a reverse curve, and that makes it great for hooking into celiac or SMA, IMA, or even the renal arteries. This is a glide cath. It's another selective catheter and it's very commonly used. Like the glide wire, it has a hydrophilic coating and it comes in different tip shapes. Often it has a 45 degree angle at the tip. The last kind of selective catheter I wanted to talk about is a microcatheter, which is exactly what it sounds like, a very small catheter. They're three French or smaller by outer diameter and they're designed to fit coaxially, meaning within the lumen of a standard angiographic catheter. Microcatheters are used to super selective, where standard catheters are not able to go, like small or tortuous vessels, and you might use them to do low volume angiography or embolization or sampling. The particular Excelsior microcatheter that you see here, it has a 1.7 French outer diameter, so it's really tiny. Its inner diameter is 0.017 inches, so it's great for neurointervention, like coiling an aneurysm, for example. Before you introduce any microcatheter into the body, you should already have your standard 4 or 5 French angiographic catheter in place, proximal to your target. You load the microcatheter with the microwire preloaded into it. So you, you insert both together as a system into the outer catheter, and you try to get to the desired super selective position where you would then carry out the rest of the procedure. I'm going to wrap up our discussion of catheters by touching on non-vascular intervention which is a category that involves procedures like draining collections or obtaining access to a hollow viscous like the stomach when you're placing a gastrostomy tube or access to a collecting system such as in the case of percutaneous nephrostomy to a duct like in biliary intervention like percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography access to a cavity when you place a chest tube you're putting it in the pleural cavity for all of these you place your catheter starting with the same Seldinger technique that we talked about before, and a series of exchanges after that. So let's say you have your catheter tip exactly where you want it to be. How do you keep it in place? How do you stop it from being easily pulled out when the patient moves? The point is that catheters need retention systems. One popular retention system is the pigtail, which is what you see here in the drainage catheter. When you place this catheter, you do so with a stiffening cannula inside to keep it straight, and once it's in place, you can take the stiffener out. Then the flexible catheter takes its natural looped shape at the distal end, and you can even lock that loop in place by pulling on a suture that's tied to the distal inner end. Ureteral stents have a loop at each end, one in the bladder and one in the renal pelvis, so they're often called double J stents. And gastrostomy tubes, or G-tubes, or PEG tubes as they're called, are used for feeding directly into the stomach. And they're retained with the balloon that you can inflate after placement, the same way a Foley catheter is retained. And that sums up needles, wires, and catheters. I hope you found the content to be informative. Thanks for listening.